Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Commercial Bank and Trust. At Commercial Bank and Trust Company, they've been catering to personal financial needs and contributing to small business success since 1877. Thank you very much, Zach, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, you might have heard I have a new guest host today. It's Zach. He's he's recently joined us here at Discovery Park of America. Hello. Um, Zach, tell us a little bit about where you came from. I went to Murray State University, major in advertising, minor in marketing. Uh, before this, I was in portal building business, doing sales and marketing with them. But uh, I, I think I found a, a true home here. I'm very excited to be here. I think but, you have too. People who are checking our social media have probably seen your posts are really fantastic. And you currently live in Paducah, right? Correct. And you're planning on finding a house here uh, in Union City or Martin or, you know, here in, in uh, this area. Um, and then you've got a lovely wife and some little kiddos. You yes, got sir. two kiddos, right? That's correct. Little little bitty babies. Yep. So um, we're excited. This Discovery Park is a great place for parents to work because your kids love coming to their parents' they work. They sure do. So, yeah, that's <laughs> great. Well, welcome aboard. Um, so today we've got a guest that is near and dear to my heart. I don't know that he's not, he is not necessarily near and dear to my heart yet, but he will be. But the thing that he works on is also something that I've worked on and I developed a passion for, and that's David Crockett. So please welcome Wade Dillon. Wade is a, a professional illustrator and artist, but he's also a museum person and a, and a, a big fan of history like I am. So we're going to have a lot to talk about. Welcome, Wade. Hi, guys. So tell me, um, what city are you living in now? I'm in Sweeney, Texas. Sweeney, so. Texas. Fantastic. So yeah. um, back us up a little bit. Um, we're going to end up with you uh, illustrating books about David Crockett, working at the Alamo, being a big David Crockett fan. But I want to go all the way back to the beginning because I know your childhood had a pretty big impact on what uh, the David Crockett passion you ended up having. Yeah. So um, I'm a native Floridian. <laughs> I was born in uh, Jacksonville, Florida in 1988. My parents really got me into art and history. It was predominantly my father, Alan, uh, who passed away in 2021, who really supported my passion for art and history by showing me as a little child, John Wayne's The Alamo and Disney's Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. And just something about Crockett, something about the Alamo story, it just stuck with me. At the age of five, I had my first coonskin cap. Uh, age of six, had my first Alamo playset. So there's a photo of me, dad, and my mom playing with this cardboard Alamo playset on my sixth birthday. Now, for people who um, are trying to figure out, well, how old is this guy? You're pretty young still. So this is not like, you know, this was not back in the 50s. Uh, no. This is probably in the 90s. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so I'm 34. I turned 35 uh, in September. So you yeah. were you were probably, um, you didn't have a ton of kids running around with you wearing coonskin caps. None. None. Uh <laughs> especially in Florida growing up, I was probably the only one outside with a coonskin cap. And yeah, my, my family and I, we took our first uh, family vacation to the Alamo in 19, in April of 1998. And it was a very short four day trip, but that, that vacation really solidified uh, the Alamo in my heart. Um, I remember almost leaping out of, uh, the taxi that we were in when we pulled up on Alamo Street on Alamo Plaza, and there was the Alamo. There was that thing that I always saw in movies, but there it was for real. At some point in this story, your dad becomes a uh, David Crockett tribute artist. Where does that happen? So um, my father and I were uh, extremely close. Um, in 1998, we lost uh, my mom. Uh, to suicide. Mm. And that really propelled my father to make changes um, 
in our life for me and my siblings. And one of those changes was renovating his childhood home in Jacksonville Beach with the iconic bell-shaped parapet of the Alamo. Hmm. So he saved his childhood home from being condemned. And as he's having this bell-shaped parapet put on top of this beach house 10 minutes from the Atlantic Ocean, we had neighbors coming up to us asking why we were building Taco Bell in the middle of the <laughs> neighborhood. <laughs> And and probably a lot of them had never been to the Alamo and probably didn't even know what it looked like. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so there was a bunch of answering questions and encouraging folks to go see the real thing in San Antonio. But um, when I graduated high school in 2007, uh, dad awarded me with a trip to San Antonio, to the Alamo, where I participated in my first Alamo reenactment, my first living history event. The following year, that's when I asked dad to participate with me. So um, that became a, a shared hobby of ours. And about 2010, 2013, dad unfortunately lost his home to foreclosure. It being part of the whole uh, Florida market, house market ecosystem. And um, he moved to Texas. Um, in 2010, I had already moved to San Antonio, Texas. And within four short months, I started working at the Alamo as a tour guide. So I'm I sorry, but I have I, to ask. I have to ask. Did your dad tell uh, them in Florida that they could go to hell, and he was going to Texas? <laughs> he he might as well have told some folks that, <laughs> <laughs> or bet. carved GTT in his door. Yeah, for See, sure. There you go. So, yeah. you, so you guys moved. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you, uh, you mentioned something that we do a lot of around here, that we have folks come here and do living reenactments of mm -hmm. history. Talk to me a little bit about the importance of that and why you feel like it's important and what do you get out of it? Uh, starting with your last question, what do I get out of living history? Um, it kind of answers both questions. Um, it It brings me and the person I'm interacting with that much closer to the time period uh, because living history is all about the material culture and possessing the knowledge of that time period as closely and as accurately as you can retain it. Um, uh, part of my attraction to the time period is uh, well, the fashion, as you see in the illustration here, you know, getting the hunting frocks correct, uh, the roundabout coats with the high ho horse collars and everything, uh, the cuts, the patterns of the clothing are extremely important. Uh, the material and the fabric that they that they would have used in the time period, if it's available today, things of that nature. Um, yeah, you're almost stepping out of a book uh, and not a Hollywood movie. If, if you're doing it correctly. And so do you find that uh, guests at the museums or the, or the uh, Alamo or wherever you're uh, uh, dressed, do, do you find the guests, you know, love to pose and take pictures and interact? Yeah, for sure. So um, I am now the museum manager for the Freeport Historical Museum. And um, in our museum, we have an original 1830s silk taffeta dress. Uh, some living history friends of mine, uh, Susan and Caitlin, they came by for um, a living history event we were having and they studied the dress and they looked at it and they realized it was a maternity dress based on alterations done along the front of the waistline. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's seeing, interesting. seeing that dress and putting that context on it. It's like, you know, folks in the 1830s were dealing with the same stuff we're dealing with today. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so you so you got your dad um, also as as uh, engaged as you were. And he started. Did he do did he uh, do the living history events frequently? I know I've seen a video on YouTube of him actually doing David Crockett and doing a whole a whole uh, scene. Yeah. So um it, it was just kind of a fluke. Um, uh, a really good friend of ours, Martin Vasquez, who actually portrays Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana down in San Antonio, approached my father to portray Crockett for an event that the Witty Museum in San Antonio was having. So um, dad actually borrowed my living history gear, uh, a gentleman's frock coat and stuff. So he's kind of more congressional Crockett, but um 
that's kind of what lit the fire for him. Um, uh, for my father, it, 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 it gave him a sense of purpose. My, my father lost a lot in his life. And so to suddenly relocate and try and find himself again, he found himself in, um, in portraying David Crockett. So, uh, by 2015, 2016, a new attraction had opened up in the river center mall called the battle for Texas, the experience. It has since shut down, but um, dad was there portraying David Crockett, leading tours, answering questions. And, um, you know, by that point, he had the coonskin cap. He had his own hunting frock and his own flintlock rifle. So um, it, it it became a passion of his. Um, he he volunteered his time at the Alamo for their uh, an evening with heroes program. So yeah, it was a, it was a source of pride for my father and uh, he really enjoyed it. So I know the folks um, listening can't see this, but I'm going to show you, hold on one second. I'm going to grab, here is, this is my coon skin cap. I got it from uh, a, a uh, company here that uh, is in union city, Tennessee, like literally three minutes from here. And they sell these real, uh, coonskin caps, and that's where I got this one. It's called Dixie Gunworks. So, yep. if anybody listening to us wants to buy their own real coonskin cap, Dixie Gunworks is where they need to go. That, that that's where I have both of mine, and the coonskin cap up there is uh, is based off of uh, one of theirs. I just had a leather bill added to it because I think there's a chance Cro- Crockett's coonskin cap had a bill, but you know. Anyway. That's interesting. So <laughs> tell me a little bit. I'm curious as, uh, you know, here at our museum in Union City, we have um, we have a Crockett statue. We have a Crockett um, exhibit here um, and uh, we're getting ready coming up um, on August 12th on Saturday to celebrate David Crockett's birthday, which is actually August 17th, 1786. He would be 237. Um so what what how do they focus on David Crockett at the Alamo as far as David Crockett the quote unquote brand? So um last year I had the fortune of kind of filling my father's shoes and portraying David Crockett for their David Crockett birthday celebration at the Alamo. This was a a year ago in August, but um uh they focused on the living history aspect of it. So um, I was I was dressed up as Crockett um, at their new Palisade wall display, which is phenomenal. The staff there did an incredible job and um, really just engaging with the public, uh, answering questions. Um, uh, (laughs) If I as Crockett got popular culture questions like, well, I thought the Alamo blew up because they saw it in a movie. It's like, well, it hasn't blown up yet. (laughs) 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 and so do you find people know um a lot about david crockett already or are they a blank slate um it it, it's kind of a mixed bag um uh, during my i I was at the alamo for about eight years and, and during my time there um you you got a mix of kind of questions and responses um, you know, the belief that Crockett never wore his coonskin cap, that that was made up when we actually have documentation that he did. Um, <laughs> the John Wayne Alamo movie definitely did a number on like the public perception of the Alamo because we'd have folks coming in claiming that the church was uh, fake or largely rebuilt because it blew up. And just having to politely uh, clarify or, or address that misconception. Um, so um, one thing that I think is, is fascinating is that David Crockett left Memphis, Tennessee and crossed the Mississippi river in late November, 1835. Mm -hmm. He arrived at the Alamo around February 8th, 1836 and was dead by March 6th, 1830. So he was really 
only in Texas for, you know, four or five months, a very short time period. And yet, if you if you ask someone about David Crockett, he is most closely associated with the Alamo probably than he is with his West Tennessee years as a congressman and as a hunter here in this area. So I've always been really interested. Uh, do you find that a lot of people just assume that David Crockett was from Texas and that he always lived in Texas? Uh I, I don't recall ever having that kind of, um, I guess you could say, uh, confusion. Um, I think uh, for the most part, when Crockett did come up, there was an understanding that he was, you know, from Tennessee or Kentucky, which were the two states folks mm. who didn't know too much would, you know, wasn't he from, well, why did he come here? Why were there so many from this state or that state here? So, Yeah. And Tennessee being known as a volunteer state. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> what, what are your thoughts on um, the controversy around was Crockett actually killed in one way or was he killed afterwards? Or uh, I know you've probably had a lot of people asking you, you know, was David Crockett a hero at the Alamo? At the Alamo? How do you answer that? Um, so, so I just had this conversation with Clay Newcomb for his Bear Grease uh, podcast. Yeah, um, you and I um, were uh, you and I were both on that on that yeah, podcast, just uh, just not together. Sure, sure. Yeah, he he he's he's a great guy. Um, it, it was a great just you know conversation. Uh, but I have the same response that I, I had for the folks at the Alamo, and um, uh, to start off, it doesn't matter to me how Crockett died because he fought and died at the Alamo. But I personally uh, believe um, that he probably fought and died in battle. Um, I I find it hard to um, believe like the De La Pena diary uh, for a multitude of reasons. Um, the, the debates as to whether or not sections of it, including the section about the execution as a forgery or not. But also the likelihood of the most famous American coming face to face with the Napoleon of the West, Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna, and Santa Anna not knowing who he is. I would have imagined that had he had known, he would have spared him and used him as leverage to show American involvement in this war. But of course, um, you know, if executions did take place, Santa Anna was carrying out the Tornell decree and uh, putting pirates to the sword. How but, do they um, tell the story? What What is the position they take at the Alamo? Or do they just not even address it really? The no, they address it because in front of the Alamo church, there's a plaque on the ground that states, uh, uh, legend states that, you know, here on March the 6th, David Crockett gave his life for Texas Liberty. Mm -hmm. And that's going off of Susanna Dickinson's account where she stated she saw Colonel Crockett's body mutilated between the church and the two-story barrack building with his peculiar cap lying by his side. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I remember my time at the Alamo presenting both sides, mm -hmm. um, just explaining we really don't know how Crockett died. Yeah. Uh, because w we have a very good idea as to how Travis died uh, because of his slave Joe. We have a very good idea as to how uh, Bowie may have met his end uh, in the gatehouse, but Crockett's Crockett's the mystery. Crockett's the mystery. Zach, have you been to the Alamo? I have not. Did you know much about David Crockett before you started working I here? I sure have not. See, I think that's the importance of places like Discovery Park and the Alamo and the museum you're at is to keep these names and these stories mm -hmm. Um, alive because their contributions are so significant, especially David Crockett had such an interesting story, you know, to me, obviously he captured my imagination yeah. and I hope he does the visitors who come to discover. I've, I've definitely learned a lot Yeah, since I started here. Um, um, have you read my Crockett book? I have not, but have it, you read I, Wade's Crockett book? It's not out yet, right? No, he's got one out oh. and we're about to talk about that. Okay. Before we talk about your book, tell us about how you started illustrating because you're extremely talented is that did that just happen um with years and years of practice or or tell me a little bit about that sure so um uh like my interest in 
Texas history, Davy Crockett and the Alamo. It started when I was young. So, so uh, I, I guess really the films are to blame. Um, I watched the movies and then, uh, you know, as a kid, I would want to draw what I saw. So, so I remember in kindergarten drawing these huge epic battle scenes with David Crockett and such. And, um, um, uh, my father especially always encouraged, um, I, I pursue my creativity. And so there's, there's photos of me drawing on a magna doodle. Um, I've, I've got a lot of, uh, you know, Christmas memories, uh, getting my first art table, getting art supplies. Uh, so, uh, that, that's something that's always been, you know, like the Alamo and Davy Crockett, that's always been a huge part of my life. Um, I illustrated my first children's book in 2011, uh, through Pelican publishing company. That was the Alamo from A to Z. So A is for Alamo, B is for Bowie, C is for Crockett. Rocket um, is written by Bill Shamurka, who uh, who had formed or was a former president of the Alamo Society. And so a lot of passion, a lot of knowledge went into that book. And then we did the sequel to it, Davy Crockett from A to Z. And we actually have that in our gift shop, Zach. So you could go, you could go get a copy of that. Fantastic. Um, and it's filled with uh, Wade's illustrations. Okay. Yeah. So uh, since then, um, I, I've been a freelance illustrator doing mostly historical illustrations. I've done um, I've done work for the Alamo. I've done work for the Texas Historical Commission. Uh, but now, uh, especially after losing my dad just two short years ago, I'm working now on my passion project. And that's a graphic novel on David Crockett. It's been an idea that I've had since dad renovated his house with the bell-shaped parapet of the alamo so while this graphic novel is not out yet uh, i am currently working on it so we're going to take a quick break and when we get back i want to talk to you about the the graphic novel and also pu publishing the whole world of all of that so um, we're going to pick this back up as soon as we get back Commercial Bank and Trust Company is a unique full-service bank with nine branches located throughout Memphis, Paris, Union City, and Jackson, Tennessee. Commercial Bank stands ready to put more than a century's worth of tradition to work for you. To learn more about their sophisticated approach to financial services, visit them in branch, by phone, or online. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. That's how we get the word out about the fun we're having here at Real Foot Forward. Um, if you are just now joining us, uh, which they say on the radio, but on podcasts, that's kind of silly because you would have had to fast forward through the podcast. But anyway, we have Wade Dillon, uh, who is a professional illustrator, artist, and David Crockett fan. Um, we're talking all about David Crockett and his life. And now I want to talk a little bit more um, about Wade's career as an illustrator and this graphic novel that he's putting together. Um, have you got a publisher already or are you going to self-publish this book so uh my graphic novel on uh, david crockett i'm going to self-publish um uh i've got several reasons for it but um it's it it's a story geared for adults uh yeah, there, there's a lot of personal uh themes in it and um, um i don't want to give too much away but a lot of violence and it's going to be fully fully illustrated uh, but I'm, I'm going to self-publish uh, just so that I can maintain complete creative control. It, it's it's entirely my book, uh, my story. So, and you'll be able to make more money if you self-publish. Sure. <laughs> and is it uh, is it a color graphic novel? Or black yes. And white? Yeah. It it it, 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 it so um, it's going to be a large format graphic novel so each uh normally your comic books today are like six by nine this is going to be eight and a half by eleven so like your standard letter size sheet um each page of a comic book is broken down into five to seven panels 
And at 223 pages currently, that's over a thousand separate images that I'm creating. And um, I'm just getting started on page five. <laughs> I mean, there, there are a lot of like collectors and stuff who will probably want to buy your original uh, drawings for the book. You know, sure. individually, you'll be able to sell in addition to selling the book itself. So uh, in the case of creating the illustrations for the graphic novel, I am doing all of them digitally um, just because I, I go back and I erase and alter things constantly. And, and it's just quicker for me to work that way. Whereas if I were to do it traditionally, it'd be on 11 by 17 size sheet of paper, which is then yeah. formatted down to six by nine and, I don't want to deal with all of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that makes more sense. Everybody's doing everything digital nowadays. I'm old. So I go back to the days when people were trying to do those things, you know, sure. by hand. And, you know, th this is uh, so much easier. I'm, I'm guessing, although certainly not easy. Um, but it, it looks amazing. Well, well, th thank you. Um, I, I'm doing everything in, in Photoshop. So while it's a digital illustration, I'm still drawing everything out you know, by hand, mm -hmm. everything that I know as an artist, I'm applying to uh, that digital file. So yeah, it, it, it's quite, it, it's quite an undertaking, but man, I I've had, I've had a lot of fun working on it so far. Um, are you starting, are you starting with his birth and going through his whole life or is this just something that picks up at the Alamo? I, I don't want to give too much away, but okay. um, I, I, I want to say that the graphic novel does cover his life pretty well. Okay, that um, by, by the end of the story, you, you'll have a pretty good understanding as to who Crockett was. And I think, um, you know, Crockett's story has been has been done a lot, um, especially at Hollywood. But I, I think... Um, especially after everything I experienced the last two years, I, my perspective on life has changed. It got me to understand Crockett's journey much better. And so I was able to really apply those things to this story, to this telling of Crockett and really explore some very deep themes of, of loss, uh, of death, of suffering tragedies and, 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 um, you know, how that affects the person. Um, well, and, you know, Crockett settled here in West Tennessee, just a few miles from where we are now in 1822. Um, and so he was our congressman. Uh, my ancestors actually settled in this area in 1832. And so he was their congressman. So this, hmm. this area, you know, really uh, has a lot of connection to David Crockett. So make sure you put West Tennessee in there. <laughs> In there. Oh, East oh, Tennessee, for sure. East Tennessee I, loves to talk about David Crockett, and I love East Tennessee. But you know, David Crockett spent some time in West Tennessee too, so we got to make sure oh, we we own him. Absolutely, from from Limestone to Lawrenceburg to to Rutherford. So so yeah, uh, I'm in Texas now, but uh, I, I've managed to get reference photos where I can of Tennessee. So have you ever been to Discovery Park? No, I have not. The last time I've been to Tennessee was in 2005, so I need to get back up there. Yeah, yeah. We need – I tell you what, we definitely – you know, when we get ready to celebrate David Crockett's birthday, either next year or the year after next when you've yeah. published your book, we definitely want to get you here to meet and greet folks and sell books and autograph and stuff like I that. I love that. Yeah, thank you. So um, what's next on the book publishing? You are – you said you were up to uh, what page? Page five of two hundred and twenty-three. <laughs> okay, so you've got a ways to go. How long does it take to do each each page? So, so each page, I, I I start out as I would a traditional illustration. I I start out with kind of a thumbnail sketch, then I kind of lay out the entire page because comic books have a structure similar to film. You've got to guide the reader's eye, and in the case of comic books, graphic novels, you're reading in a zigzag formation. It's guiding your eyes left to right, zigzag across the page. So there's all sorts of structures related to creating comic books that I'm trying to adhere to as part of the storytelling aspect. But it can take me uh, 
probably a week on the digital pencils. Uh, then I'll go in and ink and color digitally. Um, but then what I'm going to have to do is hire um, what they call a letterer, someone who works in the comic book industry, who does all the dialogue, mm -hmm. all the text uh, to go in there and, and, you know, put the word bubbles where they're supposed to be. And so, yeah, that there's a whole production aspect to it. Yeah. That's a big undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we ought to look at, uh, you know, another thing that would be cool to do. So you're doing these digitally, right? So there'll right. be in Photoshop. If like, if a museum wanted to do an exhibit of your work after you're finished, you could enlarge those uh, and do a, an exhibit of the illustrations and kind of tell the story that way as well. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, since these are going to be printed on eight and a half by 11, I've, I've been doing all the illustrations at, 600 dpi which can be blown up to sure. a very large scale so um well, let's yeah. let's pencil that in for 20 2027 2028 something <laughs> like that I, I i really hope it doesn't take that long i <laughs> I'm, uh, I, uh, I i finished writing the script probably march or april yeah so so around the time of the anniversary of the Battle of the Alamo and the Battle of San Jacinto. Um, so being inspired by all of that to finally finish. And then um, I, I immediately got started on page one. And so now it's been a little slow, but I'm on page five. <laughs> well, you've also, you've also got, you know, a full-time job that you're yeah. trying to do as well. Uh, before right. we go, tell us a little bit about your museum there that you work with. Yeah, so uh, since 2020, I have been working here at the Freeport Historical Museum in Freeport, Texas. Uh, I am now the museum manager, and we are in the process of restructuring the entire museum into a historical narrative timeline from early history to modern day. So that includes installing new bilingual interpretive panels to guide visitors through the history, and um, uh, bringing in new museum quality display cases. So it, it's really coming together. Uh, we do focus uh, a little bit of museum space on revolutionary Texas history. Uh, the Battle of Fort Velasco occurred just four miles away from here in 1832. And um, Crockett's nephew, William Patton, was in Galveston uh, after um, Crockett's death at the Alamo. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, I actually have an original newspaper that mentions Crockett's nephew, mentions the treaties of Velasco. Uh, we have um, artifacts from the Goliad massacre from the Battle of San Jacinto. So really try to, you know, represent the time period and, uh, you know, that section of history as well, as well as a brand new uh, uh, Texas Navy room. So, Yeah. Excellent. It, it, yeah, it's it's really becoming a nice little uh nice little nugget of a, a coastal museum here. So And how far away from the Alamo are you now? About three and a half, four hours. So it's a nice it's a nice day trip. If somebody wanted to go check out the Alamo and then come visit you there, It'd be a great way to uh get your uh, Texas history fix. Oh they they sure could. And um uh from San Antonio to here. Uh, that there's there's so much early texas to see mm. especially in brazoria county you've got well you've got velasco which today is the town of surfside you have west columbia brazoria jones creek there's so much history out this way too excellent well this has been fun if if people want to check out your work and we've talked a lot about it and i'm looking at the pictures behind you but if people wanted to see for themselves where would they go to check out your style of design and and learn more about your previous books for sure uh you can follow me on facebook uh just type in w dylan illustrator that's d-i-l-l-o-n and then you can find me on instagram threads and twitter at Wade Dillon Art. 
Fantastic. And we'll link to those uh, in the show notes as well. So if you're driving your car right now and you can't get to write it down, just go back and look at the show notes and we'll put the links um, on there. Um, well, I cannot wait to get you physically here to Discovery Park for one of our David Crockett birthday celebrations. I'd love to make it, man. And I just want to say I loved your book. I love how you fit Crockett into the scope of everything else happening around him. Um, that hadn't been quite done uh from the Crockett books that I have read. So I thoroughly enjoyed your book, bud. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, That's really nice of you to say. And thank you to all you listeners who've joined Zach and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. 